Hi, I'm Chrissy Giuliano, the Executive Director of the Big Cities Health Coalition. The coalition is a forum for leaders of America's largest metropolitan health departments to exchange strategies and jointly work together on things like policy and other public health challenges. We have 30 uh, members in the coalition, which are generally the largest and most urban cities and the health departments that they serve across the country. In a few minutes, you'll hear from two of our member cities, Columbus, Ohio, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Mashika Roberts from Columbus will talk about all they are doing to address vaccine hesitancy in their communities of color. And you'll hear from a team in Minneapolis hearing about the work they're doing to engage the community. Before they share those thoughts with you, we wanted to share a few high level points on behalf of the coalition. First, it's critically important for the federal, state, and local public health enterprise to work together in tandem. We know how important a comprehensive, federally led and resourced detection and response infrastructure is to things, to responding to challenges like COVID. Though it needs to be carried out and developed with local and state partners, it's critically important that again, states and locals are seen as true partners, providing situational awareness of what's happening on the ground and working with the federal government and partners again at the state and local level to inform what's needed for the response. The information that state and locals can share with their partners really needs to feed into in all of government response. The lack of comprehensive national guidance and messaging in the early days of COVID-19 led to a patchwork of activities across jurisdictions, which was not always based on science and data. It's also really important that we update our data systems to make them more comprehensive and timely. It's well documented that the governmental public health systems data infrastructure, particularly at the state and local level, is lacking. A continued investment over the next decade at the CDC that provides funding directly to support state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments could transform today's public health surveillance system into a state-of-the-art, secure, and fully interoperable system. An immediate, large, and sustained tranche of federal funding must be given not just to states and not just the CDC, but also local jurisdictions to truly enable this 21st century data infrastructure and strengthen information sharing from the federal all the way down to the local level and back up. CDC should also work to evaluate the current electronic lab reporting system. As this task force knows, demographic data was and still remains a challenge to collect related to COVID, which according to some is due to existing lab reporting systems. CDC and partners across the administration should assess and report out on the status of these systems and dollars need to be provided to upgrade them as necessary. Federal entities need to take both federal capacity and local health department experience into account when making future recommendations in order to accurately detect emerging infectious disease. For example, many large local jurisdictions are in favor of a centralized data collection tool and technology systems with standardized capacity metrics, immunization records and definitions, and would be eager to collaborate with the CDC and federal partners to ensure that this tool is created in such a way that its uptake would be swift and effective. Finally, as the task force knows all too well, health disparities and equities in the United States are neither new nor unique to COVID-19, but instead are driven by structural and social determinants of health, including hundreds of years of systemic racism. In order to adequately address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, we must act now to ensure that those most impacted are reached and resourced and treat racism as a public health crisis by examining not just our health systems, but also looking at the very fabric of our economy and our communities. Achieving equity and good health for future generations is BCHC's mission and achieving this will not be easy. Acting on racism through a public health lens may help to reframe the conversation and illustrate that we are all only as healthy as the least healthy among us, as this pandemic too has shown. But doing so will mean rebuilding our communities and in some cases the systems within which we operate so that each and every person, no matter where they live, the color of their skin, where they were born, has the opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. We at the Big Cities Health Coalition stand ready to work with you as you move forward with your charge. 
We thank you again for this opportunity to share thoughts with you and please do not hesitate to reach back out to us if we can be of more assistance. Now you'll hear from our members. Thank you. Racism is the root cause of long-standing health inequities that have left black and brown communities more vulnerable and at greater risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19. Yet across the country, we are seeing much lower vaccination rates from African Americans than for whites, leading to poorer health outcomes of people of color. The reasons are many, including mistrust, misinformation, access and historical mistreatment by the medical community. The Tuskegee experiment and the legacy of Henrietta Lacks are not far from mine for many people in this country. Vaccine hesitancy is real and we must acknowledge it. It will take all of us in every community, large and small, working together to address the challenge of vaccine hesitancy and increase access for communities of color. We must reach and engage vulnerable communities where they live and work to remove barriers like transportation, time off work, and childcare. We must entrust influencers like pastors, physicians, and community leaders to carry accurate information into the community and address the myths and answer the questions they have. And we must increase access by getting vaccines into our most vulnerable neighborhoods, considering all factors that impact health, such as income, race, medical conditions, and transportation. Our country's ability to win the battle against COVID-19 is contingent on making sure we reach and vaccinate our black and brown communities who are at most risk. When we protect the most vulnerable among us, we protect our entire community from COVID-19. Related to engaging marginalized communities in the COVID-19 response, something that we really focused on in Minneapolis is getting started early. And early on in our response, we worked to build community relationships that were new, but also to include community relationships that we've been working on for some time uh, and where we have confidence and we have trust that existed already. Uh, something we did very early on was including community members in the decision-making process at the beginning of our incident management team being stood up in this response. We called that group our SPAC, our Shared Power Advisory Committee, made up of over 20 individual community members represented from all over the city. Uh, and we met twice weekly to inform the decisions that were being made at the beginning of our COVID-19 response. That was really an integral component of making a lot of decisions that were relative to community needs and centered the importance of some of those issues inside of the community. Uh, a good example of kind of how we were able to move beyond that into application is I think beyond the time where we were doing planning and the initial response and the distribution of PPE, but getting to the point where we were also doing vaccinations. And those relationships that we had and we had built in areas of the community where we needed to put more effort and energy enabled us to start doing vaccinations with our public housing partners in a very intentional way. Um, beyond that, we were really intentional about creating our PIO, our public information and outreach section of our IMT to really reflect the gaps in information that we were learning about. Not just that folks couldn't get information, but that information was being regularly released in English first and then a number of days or even weeks later, being able to release that information in multiple languages. We've done that through also engaging community partners in helping to develop those messages and focusing on trans creation rather than focusing on just translation of English materials. It's been really integral for folks to get information in real time and to be empowered to make decisions for themselves based on that information. A lot of that has also relied on our relationships with community members and trusted messengers to not only get our messages out, but also to make those messages themselves for moving it forward. Some things that we learned throughout uh, this is to really rely on built relationships and to start building those relationships early. Building a relationship with a community member or an organization once the emergency has already started is very difficult. 
uh, relying on relationship building techniques that begin long before the emergency has been defined has been really helpful. It's an area we've excelled and an area where we have a lot of work to do. Uh, something else that we learned the hard way is to really think about equity from the beginning, to immediately let that drive us and not to um, forget until the time of implementation comes in to think about the tactics by which we will be equitable and we will be inclusive. So getting ahead of those conversations, even though we started having them, our systems weren't built to implement things in an equitable way right from the get-go. So we've really learned to think about our internal systems and how they relate to equity throughout the entire response and in our preparation to begin the response. Having the funding early on to build these relationships and honor the relationships and get those um, get those relationships in place on purpose before we actually have to start acting is really important for making sure that we have a good footing to move forward. I think something that we noticed early on was that we didn't have the funding in place to get these relationships up and running at the beginning when we needed it. So really thinking about how we can have funding that's pre-allocated for local public health to honor these relationships with community-based organizations and individuals is really important to making sure that we already have the structures built and we have the relationships built before we need them inside of the pandemic and or, or the whatever future emergencies may come. Um, something that would have been really helpful early on is funding for communications and for translation. Uh, something that we noticed all, all throughout was that we didn't have enough people to speak to everyone in our community. It's a major metropolitan area and it is full of many languages and many cultural approaches and many different ways of receiving and interpreting information to make decisions. So something that is really helpful is having that funding already in place for communications, for community interventions, for collaboration. And often we see that funding is tied directly to a specific outcome. Um, for example, get you know, XYZ amount of vaccinations in a certain community versus having that ability to have funding that is flexible. Ideally, we're able to pass that out because we've been able to focus on data collection to know where we need to be, to know what interventions need to be in place, and then to be able to reach out to community to share that information with them and have them participate in making those decisions. But that means we need a lot more of the money on the front end uh, so that we're able to engage in that way. Um, when we talk about communication, we talk about two main things, which is uh, trusted messengers and trusted message, messages. Uh, so with that platform, we, we leverage on our relationship with five partners, community-based partners, representing each one of our priority communities. Those communities were the Native American, African American, East African, Latino, and um, um, Asian Pacific uh, and Islander uh, communities. So focus on each one of those communities, uh, prioritizing these specific communities, we engage them into the process of sharing vaccine information through their efforts, being the trusted messengers, um, doing on the ground efforts to connect with our community members and, and talk to them about vaccine and why it was important to get vaccinated to protect uh, their communities, their families uh, and the city. Uh, one thing we learned from that interaction, especially with our community-based partners, is that it wasn't just as simple as, here's the information, share it out, you're the trusted messenger, you know how to do it. It was more about also listening from them. As they were doing that approach, they would come out to us with needs and with concerns or with things that we didn't have. So how we work together from there to co-create materials that were uh, that were needed and that were relevant for, for these communities. So this is where we approach the whole concept of how we uh, engage into the creation process, listening to what are the main concerns that the community has, what in, in what uh, material that can be developed, in which language, how should be the tone. Um, and you have to be prepared. I mean, we're talking about uh, 
community members representing community groups and uh, sometimes the feedback can be brutal sometimes it could be challenging because that you know they come with great perspectives in great uh, resonance as to why they are asking you for certain things so you have to be able to take a step back and listen and incorporate those thoughts and insights into your into your plan uh, so that with that we develop uh, several materials, uh, starting with our uh, vaccination website, uh, vaccine um, informational sheets, uh, vaccine event flyers. We develop a social media toolkit. And uh, let me explain to you a little bit of how we develop that, it's starting from the insights, hearing community um, uh, members telling us what they need. And what we wanted to do is to have a uh, cultural context to be cultural appropriate, linguistically also um, being able to have it in different languages. And the way we took this approach, it wasn't just creating the English version and translating it because uh, as, as, the, as the PIO lead, I do not believe in translation. I believe in transcreation where you really get the essence of that message. And you might be able to use different words to describe that essence, but at the end of the day, you are getting your, your message straight to, to what the audience um, wants to hear or, or you wish the audience to, to, to understand or learn. Uh, so from that perspective, we, we took the insights, we apply the cultural context, the, the needs, the concerns, uh, the meaning of this message, and then uh, we we created them in the language of uh, of the specific audience. So again, I mean, I, I know that that's uh, we're talking about resources today and how what, how we would like to see this in the future, and really an approach, a meaningful approach to communication efforts that are culturally specific, culturally relevant. And also that includes several languages that our community speak. Uh, once you develop that material, then you can uh, partner up with your trusted messenger to come out with uh, a, a good message and, and a good approach to share that message, message to your community. 